Hi, writers, and welcome back to the Paid Copywriter Podcast. My name is Christine. I'm the creator of paidcopywriter.com. I put out resources where freelance writers can learn how to land clients and transition out of their nine to five to full time freelance writing as a career. So today I am interviewing Cheryl Woodhouse, a neurodivergent digital nomad who freelanced full time for almost 20 years before deciding to teach others how it's done. They now spend all day, every day, teaching neurodivergent freelancers and service providers to stop living paycheck to paycheck by building packages, pricing, proposals, and a client enrollment system to turn leads into long-term high-ticket clients without all the effort. She herself hosts a podcast where she interviews successful neurodivergent entrepreneurs called Master of None, and she shares her knowledge on a YouTube channel. She does weekly co-working and live training sessions in her Facebook group, which I'll link to. So enjoy today's episode. What advice would you give to someone who they want to leave their full-time job to freelance, but they're really filled with so much doubt because they know themselves and they know that they've had certain symptoms, you might call it, and lack of focus, lack of follow-through, lack of consistency? So I would say, understand that you've been trying to operate in a paradigm that wasn't designed for the way that your brain works. And employment is not designed for neurodiverse people. It is designed for neurotypical people. It is designed for people who can pin a deadline up on the wall, work backwards to figure out the steps to accomplish a task and work on those steps consistently every day without getting bored and chasing a butterfly out the window because they don't want to, right? Or even because they really want to, but their brain won't let them and the the ADHD paralysis kicks in and the rejection sensitivity kicks in and makes you not want to receive feedback and the pathological demand avoidance kicks in and makes you not want to do it because someone's asking you to. All of these different kind of clusters of ADHD symptoms make it very hard to exist in that environment. You need to design your freelance business to work for you the way your brain actually works. You've been trying to operate in a paradigm that wasn't designed for the way that your brain works. And employment is not designed for neurodiverse people. It is designed for neurotypical people. The word neurodiverse is a new term for some. I know it was for me. Can you explain what neurodiversity is and why this term is important versus the other terms like ADD, ADHD, autism? So I'm far from an expert on the term, but neurodiversity is essentially an umbrella term for anyone who thinks differently. So that includes autism, it includes ADHD, and it's just a more inclusive term for all people who are neurodivergent is is the term to use there as well. And so again, not an expert on the term. I do know that many people still do prefer like identity first language. I am autistic. I have ADHD and you know, I am neurodivergent. That, that is the preference for a lot of people in those circles. They can sort of be used interchangeably. Neurodiversity just covers kind of everything in the umbrella. And tell me about your background and what led you to mentoring neurodiverse freelancers. It's a very interesting niche. Tell me about your journey and what led you here. So as with most things, as a neurodivergent person, it was a very interesting journey. I figured out the freelancing part first and I spent almost 20 years as a freelancer. I was a sole provider for myself and then my family as we grew our family, you know, and it There were a lot of ups and downs earlier on in that journey where I experienced, you know, those feast or famine cycles and the income roller coaster and not knowing where my next clients were coming from. And I was following all of the typical advice, right? I was trying to find a niche. I was specializing and figuring out what I wanted to, what I really wanted to narrow in on, trying to build an email list, building a good site with lead magnets and all the other things. I was following all the conventional advice, but there were multiple problems in making that work. One of them just being, I couldn't stick to one niche or one service or one interest long enough to actually build up an audience in that area. I always felt like, okay, it's not working. I need to try something else after I get like one, two, maybe three clients in each niche, or I would get bored and 
same thing. And over time, I just kind of refined the system that worked for me. And initially, I thought it was just a different way of doing things, right? I developed this way of consciously choosing to move into new niches or new subsets of niches on purpose as a way of getting new clients and developing new offers in that space. So I would do market research and then I would use the network I built from doing that market research to get a set of initial clients to test things out, make sure I enjoyed doing that work, make sure I enjoyed working with those people. And then I would develop uh, a long-term high ticket offer so that as I moved into my next niche and did my next set of market research and played around with even more things, I still had consistent income every single month coming in and covering my bills and paying things. And uh, I did that for almost 10 years, just kind of in the background on my own, making a living, which is a thing that a lot of people I found out actually dream of doing. They don't want to be loud. They don't want to have an online presence. They don't want to have a big audience. They just want to quietly make a living. And later in 2020, I finally had to start expanding because I wanted to take on more projects, but I had no more capacity. So I started bringing on other freelancers to work with me, copyright content creators and assistants. And I kept getting questions from them over and over and over again about basic freelancing stuff. Like, how do I structure this? How much should I be charging you? What should I be doing here? Et cetera, et cetera. And I answered questions. And one of them said to me, you should be teaching this stuff. Like you've been doing this for so long you should step out and start teaching other people how to do this. And so initially I explored this from the angle of, I'm just going to teach freelancers how I did freelancing. It's just a different way of doing things. Simultaneously, we were on a journey of diagnosis and discovery for my husband who had been with ADHD for most of his life. And he's the type of person where when you meet him you're like if you don't have adhd just slap me right now because he's he's the stereotypical like super talkative bouncing all over the place with his ideas sort of person very friendly very energetic loads of fun and has issues with consistency right so we were working with his care team to do that while i started building out this freelancing course and ahead of one of his doctors and he had to do this assessment thing you may have seen like they have a depression scale that's similar to this but this is for adhd and i walked him through the questions and as i was answering the questions for him being a lover of personality tests and quizzes i also answered the questions for myself and i'm like okay i could check that one off and that one and wait all of these all of these are in <laughs> the you know the gray area for me and gray on that assessment means you're within the criteria for diagnosis and so i started exploring like everyone else is doing with neurodiversity right now and i ended up on tiktok and i ended up on youtube and facebook and in a bunch of different groups and now i'm awaiting my official diagnosis and my therapist agrees that yeah the the reason that none of that consistency stuff and the niche stuff and all the things I tried to do or conventional wisdom never worked for me is because I probably have ADHD. So that's when I made the decision to start supporting other people. And lo and behold, everything from my journey resonates with them. And I love it because it's it's affirming for them to see like someone like me has become successful doing this. Someone like me has made like three quarters of a million dollars as a freelancer total, right? And it's also affirming for me because I'm still like in that diagnosis journey and you know, nearing the finish, like, okay, yes, this really is the reason why that was so hard. This really is the reason why this worked when everything else didn't. It's not that. I'm broken or I'm bad or I'm wrong or I failed. It's that I I'm different. Yeah. Your brain is just simply wired differently. Exactly. And to clarify, when you say you chose different freelance niches, did you mean that you were jumping from industry to industry and subject matter or different types of freelance work, like maybe writing versus transcription versus graphic design or something like that? Both simultaneously. So there was a time where I jumped from like, I was the marketing director for a spirits company. And then I did sales coaching for a different spirits company. And then I became a publicist for a Kickstarter campaign. And that's like, I was just bouncing all over the place, trying anything that interested me to pick that as my forever niche and the thing that I would do until the day that I died. But the idea of sticking with that forever scared me so much that I would usually run on to the next thing within a short period of time. 
Interesting. So this conversation is just so timely and me learning about your Facebook group for divergent freelancers is just so timely. And I believe your initial title of the Facebook group actually had ADHD in it before you switched to neurodivergent, yes. which I'm glad because that caught my eye versus I might not have understood that neurodivergent encompassed ADHD. And it's just such crazy timing because I'm in a very similar boat as you, where it has just recently been brought to my attention by a doctor after listening to certain symptoms I have. Weirdly, my inability to sleep and my, my sleep problems is where yeah, I guess my doctor kind of perked up his, uh, her ears and said, that's not normal that you need like that strict of a routine just to get to bed at night with no interruptions. And when you connect the dots of all the other things in my life, like my learning disability, when I was young, I struggled with math and I was really high on the English scale, but really incredibly low. I barely could get past a sophomore level of high school's math proficiency, the learning disability, the sleep problem, some of the anxiety and depression, and the fact that ADHD is evidently very underdiagnosed in women just because of certain societal, I guess men are more likely or boys are more likely to present these symptoms pretty early on, whereas women are taught maybe to not act out as much in school. So it kind of goes undetected. So I've been under the impression that ADD presented a certain way. It sounds like your husband's presentation in terms of being very all over the place. And and you think of that stereotypical kid that's bouncing off the walls and that wasn't me. And because I like to read and write and because I like to, because I can deeply focus, I thought to myself, there's no way I have ADD, but actually being able to deeply focus on one thing that you're intensely interested in turns out to be a very common symptom of ADD. It's not a lack of attention at all times. It is a lack of sometimes being able to switch your attention from something that you're so, so interested in. There's so many different manifestations and types of ADD that are out there. And I think this conversation will resonate with people who might not identify as ADHD or autistic or learning disability, whatever, because we're kind of living in an ADHD world now where people are really struggling to focus in general and get themselves to sit down and follow through on something that they want to sit out to do. And with the freelance community, something I hear from my students as well is I just can't get myself to do it, to follow through. I want to do it. I have the best of intentions, but it just doesn't happen for me. So That's my next question is what advice would you give to someone who they want to leave their full-time job to freelance, but they're really filled with so much doubt because they know themselves and they know that they've had certain symptoms, you might call it, and lack of focus, lack of follow through, lack of consistency. You need to design your freelance business to work for you the way your brain actually works. One of the prime examples of this is hitting client deadlines. And we'll use social media management as an example of this because it's the perfect example, okay? One of the hardest services for a neurodiverse person to offer, especially someone with ADHD, is social media management because it is a never-ending hamster wheel of creating content with deadlines. And that's a very hard thing for our adrenals to keep up with because the only way we can hit deadlines a lot of the time is by using adrenaline and making it hard and stressful and ragey and angry and, you know, bringing up all those big feelings so that we can actually get the stuff done, right? Neurotypical people, on the other hand, set aside Monday, write their content, do their social media graphics and send it off to the client without issue. If we do things differently, we understand the way our brain works. The rejection sensitivity means we don't want to let people down, right? And our deadline focus and our deadline orientation means that we want to actually achieve the goal of getting something on time if there's someone external kind of monitoring things, if there's some form of accountability. If it's an internal deadline, it doesn't really work. So what I did when I offered social media management services was I set a weekly with my clients to do review. Okay, so me with my ADHD and my complete inability to achieve anything if it's self-imposed deadline and all of the other things, once a week, say Thursdays at noon, 
I would show up to the meeting and I would have to have posts with me. So I guess I'm doing that Thursday morning, right? I create the posts. I've got the content strategy because we developed that early on when my hyper focus was still excited about the client. So I've got all my hashtags. I've got my branding. I've got everything figured out in that early stage where I've got the focus. And then every, every week just becomes about creating that content and time for the meeting to maintain. We review the content live on the meeting and make edits live on the meeting. So there's no endless feedback loop. There's no waiting for things to come back before you can schedule them. And then immediately after the meeting, I schedule and I set aside some time to do engagement on that on those clients accounts. And that essentially stops me from ending up never doing engagement because it always drops to the bottom of the to do list or not getting the post done in time and missing deadlines for the client because there's that extra layer of accountability and scheduling and external pressure, which is one of the primary motivators for us. Wow. I love, love, love that. One of the questions I got on Instagram when I posted saying, Hey, I'm speaking to a neurodiverse freelance mentor. What questions would you have? One freelance writer said, how do you go about accomplishing things when we just don't have that structure to our day? So I love that you're saying that you kind of have this self-imposed structure so that it's not this internal deadline and that you proactively set that meeting with the client. I think a lot of people in my audience, because they're new freelancers and they're just figuring this out and they don't have the guidance, none of us do wouldn't even know that that's a possibility, wouldn't know to put their foot forward and proactively be like, hey, we're going to get on a call once a week and go through this together. Tell me a little bit more about how you have like the the balls to do that. <laughs> Honestly, I never really thought of it as a brave, courageous thing. It It's one of those things accidentally because I had one client who asked me to do that. And they loved it so much. And I loved it so much. I was like, I'm going to do that. And so every client after that, I now, I do all of my proposals live. I never proposal into someone's inbox and wait for them to get back to me. We collaboratively build what we're going to do. I create the proposal and I review it with them live so I can answer their questions as we go. I do like copywriting when I'm doing longer sales letters, emails, longer projects and things like that. We go through it live. We do edits live and we get final sign off before the end of the call. It eliminates that feedback loop and it clients really appreciate it because they don't have to now find time to bring this up in their priority list, to worry about it falling to the bottom of their to-do list and holding up the project. They just get to say, okay, I have a meeting at this time. I have to block it out. I'm gonna hang out with Cheryl, go through the copy. I'm gonna sign off at the end and it's gonna be done. And I haven't found a client yet who didn't appreciate that extra effort, the extra time, the care and attention that they feel like they're getting when I do that. It's just, it's another layer of value add for you. It's not something you should be afraid of offering. Yes. And you're building that relationship. I think as freelancers, we tend to be off, off on the sidelines, communicating via email. And because freelancers, specifically writers tend to be a little bit introverted, they relish the fact that they don't have to talk to clients, but one of the biggest things I try to harp on is like, Hey, have that face-to-face -face contact with your clients to build a relationship because they want to see the person face-to-face -face that they're giving thousands of dollars per month to. And in order for them to feel like they have skin in the game and they want to prolong the relationship with you, make it last longer, keep you on, they need to have some type of connection with you beyond just emailing back and forth and Google comments. Yes, absolutely. And one of the biggest tips I can give here is if you're working with not just solopreneurs, which if you're charging thousands of dollars a month, you probably aren't. So if you're working with bigger clients that actually have teams, get their teams on the call with you. Ask for other sellers who may not be decision makers to come in and collaborate on the edits because the last thing you want, first of all, is final sign off on copy and then they send it to their team and their team's like, whoa, what is this nonsense? This isn't what I was expecting and you have to do more edits after you thought you were done. But also, when your key contact is away, you can continue working, you have another source of feedback. If there's ever any disagreements or misunderstandings, you're not just dealing one on one with one person who can advocate for you. There are multiple people in that team who appreciate you and believe in what you're doing and like working with you. And it, it 
makes you a part of their culture as much as you know it helps client communication which makes you honestly i'm gonna say it this way harder to get rid of like you're integrated into their team you're a part of their team and you're a fit with their culture they know you they like you they trust you even if you just make it bi-weekly meetings everyone can spare two hours of zoom a month to make sure that a five or six figure client sticks it out with them over the long term for sure making yourself sticky especially as people leave roles like there's no tomorrow you don't i mean i can't say how many Facebook posts I've seen being like, my client just quit and now I'm not getting work and I was basing my whole income off them and now I'm screwed. So it's definitely good to involve multiple stakeholders. That's really great advice. Talk to me a little bit more about how we can set our businesses up to accommodate the way our brains work. Maybe just some quick tips because I love that you said you you set up these meetings for external pressure. Is there any other tips that it's like, okay, our brain works like this and that's why I do this? Yes. So for one, I focused on getting revenue more than getting clients. And I know this is something that's often said, but like your, your best source of work is not new clients, it's old clients, right? And so setting my sights on not, I want to get X number of clients at this package every single month and doing the mental like everyone else teaches you how to do but going okay my first step on the income ladder right now is five thousand dollars per month so i'm going to get five thousand dollars per month worth of contracts whatever that looks like the faster i can get there the better and i built services a la carte off of a menu of things that i could do rather than coming in with set packages because that allowed me to upsell more to each individual client and work with them more deeply then simultaneously to that instead of having set packages and instead of having you know shorter set duration and trying to bring in more clients reselling to existing clients upselling to existing clients and getting them to work with me over the long term right but i also worked with multiple clients in different niches with different skills at the same time and To a neurotypical person, that probably sounds like a complete nightmare to keep track of because nothing is consistent and I have no systems and processes. And yes, systems and processes and structures can be very supportive. But those systems and processes and structures in my are better suited to managing your energy and helping to manage your energy and not so good around getting paid and creating value because those types of structures tend to limit our creativity make things feel boring and stagnant so we lose interest and it's harder to deliver so simultaneously working on you know a yoga studios website and building an online course for a horse trainer and then working with an education startup on doing user experience research that's literally what one month of my life looked like and it was great because i could take the learnings from each of those different clients and make the connections that neurotypical can't make between how something from let's say the horse trainer could be applied to the ed tech startup and something from the ed tech could be applied to studio and it kept me creative it kept me interested it kept me wanting to fulfill things when something got boring i could go in a completely different direction and it gave me momentum that i wouldn't have had if i was just let's say solely building websites for yoga studios that would have gotten really boring very quickly I'm curious, what is your predominant way of getting clients? I know you said it's not all about just like getting clients, getting clients, getting clients. But one of the things that I always suggest is to choose a niche in the beginning, just to build a portfolio and be able to get clients. What's your preferred way of getting clients? So my preferred way is actually to pick a new niche and to do market research in that niche and get 10, 15, 20 people like on Zoom, on a phone call, interviewing them about their needs, getting referrals to other people help. And the reason I do it that way is because it's a very kind of unassuming, easy request to make of people. So it's easy for them to say yes to. I get introduced to a lot of people who have already achieved what I can help other clients achieve. So it's not all about just doing market research and turning it into a sales conversation. You actually get to see what will make your clients successful by by interviewing the success stories. 
which gives you credibility right out of the gate because now you can go back to the the before stories from your market research and say, look, I talked to your competitor X, Y, Z. They've already gotten where you want to go. This is how they did it, and I'd love to help you. Some people will say yes. Some people will say no. Some people will refer you. But market research is usually how I at least start getting new clients in a new niche or with the new service I'm offering. Beyond that, it's outreach because with outreach, I control the messaging. I don't have to have a website and an email list and a whole inbound funnel set up along the same lines for the same niche with the same content. I control what they see so I can have a different portfolio for different niches that I'm working on. I can even have different websites set up for different niches that I'm working on. I can have multiple things of, of experience listed on my LinkedIn profile. Like I can tailor what they see to what I want them to see and not just what they find on Google or trying to mishmash together. Can I answer your question? Yeah, I feel like this market research strategy could be a whole other interview in itself. Uh -huh. It's not something that yeah. uh, I'm super familiar with, and I think it's an <laughs> untapped strategy. Yeah, and especially the way that it, like, it's just outreach, but it's outreach in a way that's not icky. And for anyone listening, no, you do not get onto a market research interview and then bait and switch someone and turn it into a sales conversation there are some people out there promoting strategies like that. And I find that's not starting off a client relationship with integrity. It's not going to attract the best clients. It's not going to build a lot of trust. The people that you actually interview tend to become better referral sources than actual clients, with the exception of the people who land on the interview going, I just took the interview because I wanna hire you. I need your help. <laughs> Those ones tend to turn into clients fairly quickly. That makes sense. With your pricing, you said, can you just explain that? You said that instead of going in there with a set package, you go in a la carte to upsell. Explain to me what that looks like. So I, I bring more skills to the table than just one at a time. So yes, I started off as a copywriter, but I also became a web designer, a graphic designer, a social media manager, et cetera, as my ADHD made me take new courses and pick up new skills along the way, like it does for all of us. And um, so as I did this, I built up this whole menu of different services and things that I could bring to the table. Over time, I eliminated some and added new ones. And this allows me to kind of become a one-stop shop for my clients. So instead of being, you know, a, a hired gun, I guess you could say, that comes in for a specific task and, and I take an order from the client, they're not saying, I need five emails. Cheryl, can you write me five emails? They're saying, Cheryl, our conversions weren't that great on our last launch. How can you help? And so I come in and before I ever sell a high ticket long-term package, I sell an initial package, three to four weeks, testing out the client, helping them get to know me, making sure I want to work with them. And we do an audit or an assessment and then walk out with a strategy or a plan. And that allows us to really dive deep into what their needs are. And I take those and I match them with different skills that I have that can come in and actually solve those needs or fill those needs and solve those challenges. And then as I do all of that pairing, then I upsell them into the fulfillment of the strategy that we've already agreed is the way to solve their problems, which makes it really easy to sell. In terms of pricing, that could make things difficult if on your menu of services, you had a price next to each services and you were just trying to add everything up. I tend to go with value-based pricing. So throughout my discovery process, I'm always asking the client, how much more are you gonna make if we solve this problem? If we get to your conversion goal, how what is that gonna look like with your current traffic? What will that look like with your next traffic goal? I'm always trying to find out how much more are you going to make and how much less are you going to spend if this project is successful? And then I charge them 10% of that for doing the project. Okay. My time is no longer part of the equation. My hourly is no longer part of the equation. How long it takes me to do something is not part of the equation. It's just, you're going to make a half a million dollars if we knock this out of the park over the next two years. I would like 50000 to do it. That way, even if we fall way short, you're guaranteed to get 100% ROI.
I noticed that the most experienced freelancers that I speak to are talking about value-based pricing and it seems to be the best way to go. But I also think that we got to work our way up to that. Like, I'm sure you didn't come out the gate when you first started freelancing with that strategy, right? No, it was something I learned, but I never did hourly. I always did projects in the beginning and it was just an estimate based off of market rates at that point. But honestly, I think everyone could do value-based at whatever point they're at. The reason newbies don't do value-based is because they don't understand how to uncover what the value is and they don't feel confident charging the value of the project because they don't fully understand it. So say if you had a client and you were in a meeting and it was like the sales funnel client and they wanted a strategy to improve their conversion, they fell a hundred thousand short of expectations on their last launch. And they want to relaunch in six months with your help, they up that goal. They want to get that extra hundred thousand. It's really easy to understand in that moment that for the client, the goal is to make a hundred thousand dollars more, right? And to step up and say, you know, I want half. That takes a lot of courage. That takes a lot of guts. That's where the really experienced freelancers might step in and be able to do that because they know for five years down the line, they're also going to be doing the same thing. But newbies or, you know, people who don't necessarily have that confidence can't do that. But there is no reason in the entire world that anyone can give me that would make me believe that even a newbie who had the skills to help them improve their conversion rates a little bit couldn't charge 10% of that. Because you can be confident that if you make their conversion rate better at all, they're going to make another $10,000, right? Do you ever step into a, a client meeting and have this conversation and they're like, I have no idea. I don't know what the goal is. I don't know what we've done. I don't know what we're supposed to do. What about those situations? It does happen. Usually I don't end up working with it, to be honest. Like if they don't have a goal, they're not going to be willing to pay me premium pricing. They're not going to be good at giving me feedback. They're going to be terrible with boundaries. We're going to have 16 rounds of revisions. Like I've seen this before. Figure out what you want and then come back to me and I'll help you. But if you don't know what you want, asking me to do something that you're going to throw out in three months is the time. And that's what a lot of newer freelancers are running into they're like oh my god I finally got a client on a call but they were all over the place and they didn't really know what they wanted and do I suggest it and it's like uh it, it's frustrating because you want to get the business and you want to get started on your freelance career and that means not turning down clients but then they become such a pain in the ass and they make you so miserable and destroy your confidence so it's it's yeah. so tricky Yes. And the other side of that is just learning how to do really, really good discovery. Like That's one of the reasons that I do an audit or an assessment and a strategy or a plan over three to four weeks and get paid for it, because then I am doing really, really good discovery. If you have a client who comes to you and they don't really know what they want and you're not you know, really top notch with your questions during the discovery phase and trying to uncover challenges and problems, then sell them into a project like that. Say, well, since you don't really know what you want, let me do an, do an assessment. Let me build you a strategy or a plan to fix whatever I uncover and get you closer to growing your business or whatever their challenge is right now, right? And then at the end of that, you can present them with their challenges and say, how does that align with your goal? It may bring something up in them. It may not, but at least you're trying. Totally. What ways or what changes do you wish you would see maybe in the workforce or just society as a whole to better accommodate neurodiverse workers, people, freelancers, whatever? I, I don't think there is a way to accommodate a lot of neurodiverse people in the traditional employment world. I just, I think that whole paradigm is broken in general for most people, but for people that it wasn't built for, and we're talking about people of color, women, the LGBTQ community, anyone with a chronic illness or disability, caregivers of all sorts, like this system wasn't built for you. And that's why you're breaking under the crushing weight of it. So I don't know, burn the whole thing down. If that's okay to say, <laughs> start over, do something completely different. Let the gig economy take over. Ideally, that's where I see things going because it gives people so much more autonomy and flexibility 
there's a couple of key things that stop that from happening that are more systemic. One of them is, especially in the US, health insurance. That is one of the primary reasons that a lot of people who would normally just leave their job and strike out on their own don't. And if that can get rectified, there will be a fleeing of people from the job market, which say may be part of the reason why that hasn't happened yet. The other thing actually is lending. Lending practices for self-employed people for whatever reason, their risk model is primarily based off of retail type businesses, businesses where they've got, you know, new customers coming in every month, they're constantly having to sell if their marketing stops their business crashes. And so freelancers can walk in with signed 12 month contracts that have viewed for the last three years, essentially multiple part time jobs in income and still get turned down for a loan based on the fact that they're self-employed rather than having a job, even if their income is more stable than it would be in employment. And so the risk model of lending needs to change to accommodate the different types of self-employment that there are, because currently long-term contracts aren't accounted for in that model. Yeah, the healthcare in the US is a big, <laughs> really big one. and. It's so funny because as somebody who sells an online course and creates content for freelancers, a lot of my messaging is about like freedom, flexibility, but that's the one thing I really can't wrap up in a pretty package for you is that if you have a family or you have a a chronic illness that you need health insurance for, your options are not great for self-employed people. And they're not even great sometimes when you have a full-time job at this point. So there's no getting around that one, unfortunately. Yeah. Things are. Yeah. As a Canadian, the lending one is honestly the, the biggest problem because our house prices are so, like the entire country is the San Francisco Bay Area, essentially at this point. House prices are so disjointed from incomes. My in-laws, three bedroom, two bath, like, normal average house in an okay neighborhood is worth like 1.3 million dollars and the average salary around here is like 60k there's no connection whatsoever and so most canadians who are self-employed and own their own home did so when they had a job before they became self-employed and have a great deal of difficulty refinancing upgrading their home doing all those sorts of things unless they work in real estate and have friends um It's a huge barrier because essentially if you choose to freelance as a Canadian, the next five years of your life, you're not buying a house guaranteed minimum at it's a lot harder than it is for most people. It's 20% down 20% of $1.2 million is a lot of bones. You know, it's, it's a huge, huge obstacle that results in a lot of self-employed renters in Canada, believe it or not. That brings me to what you were saying about high ticket. Explain to me this high ticket term and it seems to be the key to people who want to actually make a livable income doing this yes so my idea of high ticket high ticket this is what i've learned through my mentorship program and working with people they came in and they're like oh can i really charge a thousand dollars for this and i'm like if you don't i'm gonna come at you (laughs) <laughs> like it's that is not even remotely close to what you should be charging for these level of skills high ticket is two things okay so a high ticket is yes obviously a high enough price that you can support yourself on a handful of clients we're talking three to five at most so it's easy to balance and you get flexibility and you have free time you know a high ticket to me is a minimum of 5k for a three-month contract 10 for a six and so on and so forth upward from there that's the floor, not the ceiling. Okay. And of course we want that broken down monthly. So we're getting a minimum of four figures a month for anything that we're doing. The other side of high ticket is the clients. We have to be going after big enough clients. So many people start off and because we're so visible coaches and consultants is like the niche, especially for copywriters and social media managers. They're like, I'm going to help coaches and consultants with their stuff. Most coaches and consultants are broke. Most of them. And the ones that aren't either have an in-house team or they already have so much knowledge that they're outsourcing pieces. They're looking for order takers. They're not looking for experts. There are multi-million dollar businesses in 
the town of under 100,000 people that I live in based just on plumbing fixtures. Stop looking in the online niches. Stop looking at the solopreneurs. Stop looking at the people who look for avenues to do this work. Start looking at niches where they're used to overhead. They're used to paying people. They're used to having experts. And their their revenue is in the you know millions because those are the people not that can afford you for whom your skills can make a big enough difference that it's worth it right a small community hall paying you you know five thousand dollars to build them a new reservation system they're not going to pay that off in the next five years they don't even make that much off of you know renting out the community center seniors groups and things that use it but new e-commerce website for an excavator rental company in your hometown yeah they they've got big bucks because they've got three million dollars worth of equipment sitting on the lot and they need to get it moving because every minute it's sitting there they're paying debt on that and they're not making any money they're used to paying for things they're used to paying for expertise they've got cash in the bank and they're not afraid to use it if it can make them more money look there preach <laughs> I have so many new writers who they come in and they're, it's always the niche is like, I want to help women entrepreneurs and course creators and coaches. And I'm like, they don't have the money. And I think that goes back to your, your strategy about the market research is a lot of freelancers don't understand how to gauge whether a, a, a person or a company has budget. And one of the best ways is are they a big company? Do they have a marketing budget for a copywriter? And th that's just a huge, huge misconception is, or, or a mistake is going after what looks cool, what looks like it'll be totally fulfilling. And it sucks to say that, right? Because you, of course, you want to write for someone that you're interested in or a, a topic that you're interested in. And health and wellness is like a big one. Everyone wants to be a health and wellness writer. And I'm so interested in that too, but I'm in technology and that's my niche because I have a background in it. It pays well. So it's so hard to tell people that though, like don't choose what you're passionate about. It's a hard message, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm super passionate about unconventional entrepreneurship. I am super passionate about income equality. I am super passionate about alternative education. None of the nonprofits I've ever worked for have paid me even close to a living wage, like none. If I focused on those things, I'd be able to feed myself. What I did instead was, for example, with the craft spirits industry. I'm a cocktail nerd. That sounded really fun. So I took my skills and I applied them there. And because again, they have teams, they have salaries that they're used to paying. They usually have capital in the bank to fund their growth. They are used to paying overhead because of salaries, because of equipment, because of physical buildings. They're putting out half million dollar bonds for their licenses, for goodness sake. Like these people have the money to pay someone to help them do the things that they can't do, to pay an expert to solve the problems that they can't solve. I focused on doing that. And then I did the stuff on the side for the nonprofits for like super discounted rates for fun because it filled me up and it wasn't my everything. And when you choose a niche that actually pays you adequately in a small amount of time and you can use the rest of your time to go on whatever mission driven thing you wanna do in the world, it's, it's really wonderful because the thing that you're passionate about also doesn't become slog, like this daily drudgery that you have to push yourself through. It can stay your passion. Oh my gosh, I could not have said that better. <laughs> Okay, um, before I ask you my last question that I had on the agenda, I want to just pick your brain or just ask your opinion on Upwork and Fiverr and freelancing like platforms. How do you feel about those sites? Yeah, I, I have used them. I actually, one of the first clients that I upsold into the high ticket long term thing that helped me figure all this out, Upwork back when it's called Odesk, if that ages me at all. I remember. <laughs> Yeah, it was way back, way back when. But yeah, I mean, it's tricky because those platforms control the relationship. And as a freelancer, relationships are everything. 
I am not used to freelance job boards, to marketplaces, to all of those things. If you can control the relationship, if you can say to a client, hey, I want to work with you for this project. This is a, a proposal I have. This is a gap I've seen. Let's work together long term. And can, you can control that relationship. But on Fiverr or Upwork, you either have to violate their terms of service or they have to post a project and you go like it. They make it so hard for you to continue building a relationship because they don't want and this is. It's, it's kind of a mind blowing thing for most people who realize this, but Fiverr and Upwork don't want you to have a relationship with your clients. They want your clients to have a relationship with them. They're their clients and you're just a setter coming in and providing the service. The closer you get and the more you talk with your clients through that platform, the highest is for Upwork and Fiverr to, to lose those projects, to have you go off platform, to violate the terms of service and take their money away. They don't want you to work long term with clients because they don't want the clients to get attached to you. They want the clients attached to the platform. And so, like, if you've got a bill that's due yesterday and you need work and there's a project that you can find on Upwork or Fiverr or what have you, like, save the sinking ship, go ahead. But in terms of building a long term stable business, do outreach you know, solve problems, don't become an order taker on those platforms because you don't own the relationship. Yeah, I think Fiverr and Upwork has killed a lot of full-time freelance dreams just because of everything that you mentioned and the the low prices that can sometimes dominate the site yes. and all the hoops that you have to jump through and just interesting. Okay, my last question is, what do you believe are your strengths as a neurodivergent freelancer compared to somebody who maybe does not, who is not wired that way? The connections. It's the connections that I can draw between things. So, and this is why having that menu of services and going through that deep discovery process is so valuable as a neurodivergent person. Because neurotypical people tend to be really, really good order takers. They also can be super creative. Don't get me wrong. I'm not in any way dragging typicals who may be listening. But neurodivergent people can make connections between seemingly unrelated things and use that to help clients achieve their goals. So I can see how my you know, SEO skills would help someone on a completely non-web related platform. I can see where my sales coaching background assists in email copywriting. I can see all of the different connections between different industries, between business formats, all of the different things. And the ability to make those connections allows me to bring more value to my clients. It allows me to upsell more easily and allows me to build better strategies and plans. So yeah, I definitely say it's the connections. I love that. I like to reframe these tendencies or what have you as strengths. I think that's going to be one of, I think that's the whole key behind neurodivergence as a term is just to say, you know, this isn't necessarily a disability and that more people have a brain that's wired like this. And maybe society should start acknowledging the strengths of somebody who can hyper-focus, who can draw connections between seemingly unrelated topics and tasks. So I, I'm always for a positive reframe. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of people out there who are, you know, this isn't a disability, it's a difference. And that's great. It needs to be acknowledged, though, there are a lot of people out there for whom it is a disability, and they're struggling and they're grieving the life they could have had if they weren't wired this way, and they wish that things were different, and their experience is valid, too. For sure. And I think early diagnosis and early intervention is so key. And for anyone who's listening to this and might suspect that they have ADHD and Cheryl, you might've maybe had a similar experience. It, there is this kind of grief that you feel of like, if I had known this so many years ago, I could have done this differently. I could have gotten help this way. I could have pursued this intervention. And there, I know for me now that it, this is on my radar and I'm looking back, I'm like, oh, I suffered needlessly just because no one knew to identify these characteristics in me. And it's sad. Yeah. Yeah. 
Exactly. Exactly. No one knew that the reason I excelled in elementary and then bombed out of high school was because I couldn't focus on anything that gave me any kind of stress or or felt like I wasn't good at it immediately. Like no one loved those signs. They were looking for the kid who was bouncing off the walls, not the kid who was really trying hard not to. Yeah. And, you know, even people who are listening to this and know some because I think just statistically, we all know someone who has ADD at this point or ADHD. I know for me and my relationship, because my boyfriend has ADHD, but he's known that since he was a kid, learning about ADHD has helped me to not take so many of his behaviors personally and has helped our relationship go so much more smoothly because I'm realizing it's not that he's not listening. It just looks like he's not listening because he has like a certain inattentive type where he really does. It actually scares me how much he retains of what I say, but in the moment, it looks like he's not listening and that pisses me off. So just learning about ADHD can help you look for these differences in other people and not take it personally, which is amazing. Yes. And it also, like my husband, as I mentioned, is also ADHD. I didn't realize I was for the longest time. And I used to be really hard on him for some of his ADHD behaviors because they were things that I saw in myself and I resented about myself. And so the self-talk that I would have internally, like saying, oh, you're such trash. Why can't you just do the thing you're supposed to be doing? Stop playing on your phone. Like all of that internal talk would also, unfortunately, come out with him. And now that I've learned that that's why that was happening, I've also learned how to support him. So if I see him stuck in his phone, I do a pattern interrupt instead of a blame and shame that drives that further. I'm like, hey, so you wanted to be doing this and this is what you're doing. How can I help you transition to that other task? And it works. I have clean dishes now. It's amazing. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. I love that. Well, Cheryl, tell my audience where they can find you. I think this is, again, going to be so, so critical for anybody who is struggling with attention or feeling even a little bit different and anyone who is feeling self-doubt, because that is a huge, huge problem with the people who want to take the leap into freelance is this confidence piece. So I love what you're doing and the work that you're putting out. Tell my writers, my freelancers, how they can get in touch with you and start learning from you the way I have. So the best way is in my group, which you mentioned. The easiest way to join that is just to go to soloschool.ca slash group and you can sign up there and it'll take you right in and I'll get my assistant to approve you right away. And then there's a ton of resources in the guides in there. I've done so many free workshops, free trainings on how to pick the niche that you're going to focus on right now, marrying it forever, on how to do some of the market research stuff that we talked about, on structuring and pricing those offers, all that kind of stuff. And then in terms of confidence, I also post when I have a new podcast episode in there. My podcast is called Master of None because ADHD. And we focus primarily just on featuring neurodiverse entrepreneurs who have achieved some level of success. So if you're looking for inspiration and like belief that you can do this and you want to see some examples, check out the podcast. And I'll be sure to link to that. Also, Cheryl's group, guys, I posted about fidget toys, which everyone seemed to be familiar with, except for me. And I cannot sit still on a call for shit. Oh, I love that you have it too. I mean, I have a fidget spinner right now. Yeah. These, you know, when fidget spinners blew up, I was like, I just don't get it. Like, I don't have any urge to do that. But then I looked at all the behaviors I have in terms of not being able to sit and being so restless in my body. And now that I can just like play with these little stupid toys. It's like a game changer and everyone had advice for me. So guys join Cheryl's group and no question ever goes unanswered in there. It's really great. Well, thank you so much, Cheryl. And I'm looking forward to all the material that you're going to be putting out. Yes. Thank you. It was awesome.